How's it going, Cypher Khan? Who has went to the uh, lock picking village? Just three people. For, okay, a few low ones, a few high ones. I went there last night, and I've broken out handcuffs, not because of police, but because I was bored. Um, last night, I found the high security ones that I had basically cemented to my wrist that needed to get people to like come and take them off of me. So, if they say difficult, they mean what they're saying. Anyway, so uh, I'm going to be talking about headers today. Made the slide deck two years ago. Thankfully, due to COVID, there's now two of me up here. Um, used to live in Chicago. Used to work as an AppSec consultant at Rapid7. Now a manager at Rapid7. Moved to Texas, got a cowboy hat, edited it onto my picture. Um, I like doing lock picking. Not well at it, clearly. Uh, SDR, smoked food, home brewing. I just like hobbies. So if you guys like that too, let me know. Um, yeah. So today we're going to focus primarily on HTTP response headers. So last night, David uh, Yolman, I believe how you say it, did an SMTP talk. So it was uh, EHLO, LO. Is that you? That was really good for mail headers. I'm going to focus on what you're going to see for web applications. So what do web header, HTTP headers do? Even if you're not technical, you know what a 404 is because you see it constantly. But when we're trying to convey state, you'll see 200, you'll see 403, 418 on the teapot. The 403, 401, so those are probably the pen testers in the room. Um, they also set cookies and form control browser framing, cross-site scripting controls and the like. But they especially tend to overshare. So when I think about oversharing, we're thinking market share. So when you have people putting out headers such as Apache 2.4, Ubuntu 18.04, or 2204, I'm <laughs> getting old, um, different versions of PHP. What's PHP then? You guys to laugh at me now if you want to take a moment. Nothing. Come on. All right. Um, .NET, for example. So all these people who manufacture software want to know what their market penetration is. Helps with funding, helps with... I don't know, it's kind of cool if I had more than 1% of people in the world using anything I built. So right here is an actual shot of the default PHP INI configuration. You'll see exposed PHP is turned on. What that does is it says, hey everybody, I'm running PHP and this is the version that I'm using. It also says in there, it is in no security threat in any way, but it makes it possible to determine if your server is running PHP or not. Now if you had a Wonder, besides paying for it, procurement, scope of work, and all that good stuff, what is the first step of a security audit? What do you guys recon it is? Felt pretty proud of that one. Um, reconnaissance. So when you go and look at a web server and it says PHP version 8, the first thing that you're probably going to do with that information is take it to Google. So my first language was PHP 5.1.6, which was before dinosaurs were invented. Um, and <laughs> that one has six different CVs running against it. Any version of PHP has 633. So if you're oversharing information, you can take that information straight to Google and instantly find vulnerabilities. Now a lot of folks think, okay, cool, that's security through obscurity, hiding that information. And you're right, but that's a good thing. If you have any sort of incident detection software in place, are you going to detect somebody who's sitting there banging on your server trying to figure out what you're running? Or somebody who found a nice uh, CVSS V10 or V310 severity to get directly into your server? That was probably a lot better of an aimed attack. So I know I'm picking on PHP, IIS, .NET, um, Nginx, Apache, all these different web servers and server languages. <coughs> They also have CVs as well, although Nginx surprisingly has very few of them, at least based on my research. If you guys know differently, let me know. But some casual Googling got me to that, uh, that answer. So I'm going to re, uh, reintroduce myself again now, apparently for the third time. I also built a site called HeaderInspector.com. Uh, and I also like carrying ATMs. I thought that was a clever photo for this. It was actually pretty heavy, and it didn't even have the safe on it. So how do we inspect headers? So this started out as, for Rapid7, I was writing a blog on HTTP headers, and I decided to write a script that would go and just pull out a bunch of headers and collect them and aggregate the information. So that started out fine, but then I realized this is actually kind of useful. 
So first thing I did is I changed it so I was doing just a head request. Went and pulled on a bunch of sites, realized that not everybody supports head requests, which return just headers. I was getting 405, 406, and so not implemented, method not allowed, things like that. And so what I ended up doing is having to change it back to Git, which increased how much data I was pulling down every time I hit a site and stored everything in SQL. Um, the first scoring system I built, if you had a header set, I would give you a point. If you didn't, I would take a point away. The problem with that is I was giving you a point if you had something like CSP header set, which is good, and I was taking away a point if you didn't have cache control, and those two are just not in the same tier at all. CSP headers, we'll get into what those are if you're not familiar already. So I changed it into a weighted system. So now I can say cookies are this important, or now cache control are this important. And individual attributes carry a certain weight as well. And uh, who here has actually wrote PHP? Okay, we've got four or five people. PHP.net's docs. How many times have you seen people do user land reinventions of the exact same thing? Like, hey, here's the echo function, and here's my user land implementation of that. Everybody does it. So I decided I was going to invent my own request handler, or browser, or client, or however you want to call that, to go and pull down this information from people's sites. That was a bad idea. It, it, was, it was very problematic. And so I ended up just moving to curl. Use PHP's curl library to just go and pull things down. Also, if you know PHP well enough, um, it's not very good at synchronous calls. So pulling down sites, I was doing one at a time or having multiple request handlers go and pull down this information. I also modularized it. So I made a nice little class. Instead of my uh, giant procedural monolithic script that I pounded out to get things done. So I made it a little bit prettier, where it stores the actual weights. It stores all the functions. It, handles all the uh, output, scoring output text messages. So when you go and run it, the messages are coming out of that code right there, for cookies at least. <clears throat> Went the wrong direction, there we go. So if you live in uh, Northern Illinois or maybe even parts of Wisconsin, I have no idea how big ComEd is. Uh, I used to set company sites that I worked for powered by header as ComEd, I thought it was pretty clever. Um, so there is a billion dollar Chicago land based company running X powered by ComEd inside of their headers. On some pages, not all of them. So by the numbers, uh, what I did is I went and aggregated the Moz Top 500, which is pretty accurate, pretty up to date, and the Alexa Top Million. Of course, you can't really get a current copy of that, or at least I wasn't clever enough to, so I went to GitHub, found an old version, and I ran that through my, uh, through my tool. So I ran 675,973, a number of some huge it wraps. Uh, found two bad languages, we're talking profanities, and the database was 14 gigs in size. Well, I don't have servers at my house anymore because I, I just, I guess I'm not on that tier anymore. So all this was in DigitalOcean. And I crashed my uh, droplet. So I let this thing run overnight, woke up in the morning, my data was gone. Thankfully I already had everything pretty much backed up and ready to go and I was able to restart it and expand the droplet, but that was a learning lesson. Don't let things run overnight, but just like grab things from the interwebs. And it was a very cheap droplet. So what do I mean by bad languages? We got some edgy ones in there. Some uh, server and, I don't know, maybe they, so if you look at uh, some sites, you request with DigitalOcean, they'll see the AS where it's coming from, and they'll just block it. They're like, hey, I don't want you requesting my stuff because you're probably attacking me, and they're probably right. So I'm guessing these response headers were put there as a response to them having malicious activity in the past. I have no idea, but it was entertaining nonetheless. So just like nobody's streaking through the room right now, although it would make my talk a lot more interesting, uh, indecent exposure, so 93.42% of web, the websites I scanned, these top million sites, were exposing what server they were running. So that's, that's pretty high, and it's also probably skewed for a few reasons. One, Apache does not let you remove the server colon Apache header. So that's part one. Part two is that if I'm responding and seeing Cloudflare, Cloudflare runs a lot of the WAFs currently, that is also counted as a server header. I didn't go through and like pick, this one should count, this one should. 
language version, 34.28% of those were exposing what server software they are running, so PHP, .NET, whatever else, via X powered by. And finally, the OS version, so Ubuntu, Windows, or whatever else people use for computers, uh, is showing up 38.75% of the 93%. So, that, I mean, that's kind of a lot, right? I mean, these are all large web applications sharing this information. I'm not scanning GeoCities. Couple laughs, sorry. This hair used to be full right here. That's how old, like, GeoCities is. Um, so I scanned CypherCon last night or the night before, and they got a 44.29% fail. Now, is that a problem? Probably not. I mean, CypherCon doesn't host PCI, HIPAA, FERPA, much PII. I mean, the PII it does have is the speaker's names, and, like, I'm cool if you put my name there. So that's not that important. Now, if your Amazon account or your bank is sitting there without HSTS header set or similar, that's probably an issue. So what can we do about it? You can suppress the headers. So what you can do is you tell Apache, hey, don't leak my server signature. What that does is it says, okay, cool. Your directory listing pages, your 404, 403, don't say Apache 2.4, but do it 2204, right? You can also tell PHP or the languages not to leak the X powered by. That's cool. Um, fun fact, I had moved the site around a couple times, and up until a couple days ago, I actually had directory indexing turned on on those files. So you could have like, stole my sweet images, which are all pretty lame and handcrafted. But yeah, that was a, that was a fun security finding of my own. Like, what happens if I do take the file off and just look at that? Cool. So uh, Apache, as I mentioned, is a rule breaker. The only way to remove server colon Apache out of the headers is to recompile it. Or if you run behind a reverse proxy or something else to mask it, but then at that point, is it really the direct server? Probably not. Uh, IIS, Nginx, any other server tend to allow you to remove it, which is nice. Also, headers are there to inform. So whether it's HTTPS or not, uh, content sources, refer headers, and frameability. Who knows that image? All right, all right, we got some. It's who frame Roger Rabbit? I'm, uh, I'm in my later 30s, and I still freak out thinking about the acid scene. If you guys know what I'm talking about. It's pretty rough. And I, I think it was like four when I saw that. All right, so the first one, this is probably one of the more boring ones. You, you're definitely familiar with this. Cache Control and Pragma. These headers are from the 90s. They've been around forever. Um, what this does, it tells things between the web server serving it and you if, they, if and how they should cache it for how long. So for example, when you make a request to a server, there might be caching as part of that language, or there might be something at the edge, like AJ proxy or some sort of caching uh, proxy there, right? Your ISP might have a proxy that caches it as well, especially if it's AOL browser in about 2003. They used to do a lot of that back before HTTPS. Your local cache, you might have squid. Maybe you're uh, in the middle of nowhere and you have HughesNet and you're just trying to cache all these images. That way when you re-request them, you're not requesting that logo a bunch of times. It makes sense. And finally, your browser's cache. So if we're trying to cache your banking information, that's probably a bad thing. We want you to make fresh requests every time you're looking for that information. But if it's an image, like a logo, or whatever kind of images you might like on the internet, it might be better to cache them so they're served quicker. Another one is HSTS, or HTTP Strict Transport Security. So when you request a web application, traditionally, you hit port 80. Whether you like it or not, it goes to port 80, uh, sans browser extensions that do differently. That port 80 says, hey, <laughs> we like security, go to 443, now you're on the secure protocol, HTTPS. HSTS does something nice where it informs a browser, I don't ever want you to support a HTTP re uh, request for this duration of time. So we'll get a look at what that looks like. That's a typical nice set header, that's my header, that's why I call it nice. Um, Max H error is in seconds and it sets two years. So for two years from the last request, I can't change my site to HTTP, which is cool because I really don't plan on changing that. 
Um, I also include subdomains, so www.headerinspector, headerinspector, site.com, whatever else it is, are all encompassed in this HSTS setting. And we do preloading, so I'm going to jump back a slide to the one with the image. That's hstspreload.org. So Google runs that, and what that does is it allows you to preload and hard code your site into a list that they'll use when they're looking for HTTPS sites. So that's cool because now they know right off the bat, as soon as you get a request, it's already secure. Content security policy, this one's huge. This one replaces a lot of the older ones. Um, X XSS protection, if you guys remember that one, that was kind of an Internet Explorer-esque one. Um, what this does is says, can I inline my script? So if you're familiar with how a cross-site scripting attack works, a lot of times you'll throw up the URL bar and will affect the page's style sheet or JavaScript or something similar to allow cookie theft or whatever else you're going for. If you tell it that I can't inline code through the CSP, that's going to fix that problem for you. You can also specify what sources it comes from. So for example, if I'm using Google Fonts, you can specify that here. If I'm not, well, do we want a third party to use Google Fonts? Probably not important, but if they're saying bobsevilsite.com, which I don't know, um, and I'm hosting a bad font there, I can inject that. I don't know, I don't know what attack vectors exist via fonts, but I'm sure they exist, because computers. Um, let's see what else. So you have options for blocking, which means if, this, if there's a violation of your CSP, it will block that request. So if I'm trying to go to off-site to get a font or an image or a script or a style sheet, it will just block that. I'm jumping a little ahead in my head here. Um, which is uh, certainly helpful. It's difficult for me to header inspect though. So my site doesn't go very far into that. Because how do I know what resources your site needs unless I literally crawl your entire site and at that point? Like, I don't know the laws. I don't have time to build a crawler that's going to do all of that information and give it away for free. Because the site's free. Like, I'm not trying to make money. So here's Facebook's content security policy. That's kind of a wreck, but it works. You can see inside of there, I used uh, different colors. Uh, the default source says, I don't care what type of request it is, these are safe domains, so Facebook, FBC, the end, whatever else. Images are a little bit smaller. Uh, you'll see in, we got images, connect. Um, connect is for XML, HTTP request, and similar, or if you're using uh, whatever jQuery uses to do requests. I'm drawing a blank on it right now, but it helps suggest where that is allowed to connect to. Content security policy, dash report, dash only, just snarks on you. Right? It doesn't actually stop the attack. So if your organization is trying to roll out CSP headers, and you are very opinionated about how you roll it out, but you don't know your application well, it's, it's just gonna break for people. You put it in report only, it's gonna take a nice JSON blob, lob it over the fence to a URL that you specify. You could track that, and then use that to later on go through and say, hey, you know, I need to adjust or add these domains, or I keep on getting attacked by this IP, or whatever it might be. X-Frame options. So a little fun backstory. Back a long time ago, I decided to make an in-browser operating system, which we all know is just kind of a joke, especially now with JavaScript assembly. That's probably something you can do. I quite literally made a text editor with a text area. I made a calculator and I made a browser with a, a frame and a little input box. And I realized that I could go and hit all these GeoCity sites, no problem. They would get framed in my little web browser, no problem. But what I couldn't do was Google. I couldn't figure out why. Like, why can't I type Google.com and pull up in my fake little browser? Well, back then, Google was setting it where you could not frame their site. So when you frame a site, what you could potentially do is use absolute positioning of elements to put input boxes over the top of login elements. So if somebody is trying to, it's called clickjacking, right? If you go in there and try to log into a site, you're like, oh, cool, this looks like the default login, but it goes to my site. That's a problem. So you have two options for extreme options. You have deny and you have same origin. Deny means nobody can frame it. That's probably what you're going to use unless it's you know 20 years ago. Or you have same origin, meaning your site can frame it. But if you don't have that site at all, everybody can frame your site. Something else that I mentioned on a previous slide. 
RFC 6648 says that the, to drop the X prefix from non-standard headers. Because standards are like the XKCD uh, cartoon, we have technical debt versus a best practice of problem. So this header still has an X before it, even though since 2012, they said to drop the X on it. Refer policies. So this one is interesting because traditionally what you would do is you would go to a website, click a link, so think in terms of forums or Facebook or whatever, and it will go to another site and it will share where you just came from. If you were on bobsbank.com forward slash account number and then I decided to click off there to go somewhere else, they would theoretically have your account number. Now there are some exceptions there, but if it was going from an HTTPS site to HTTP or to another HTTPS, it would not send those headers over, which is nice. Nowadays, you can actually be a bit opinionated on it. So no referrer says, I don't care, nobody should send a refer from my site to anywhere else. A lot of people have built security applications and say, oh, I'm gonna check refer and make sure this request came from my domain. You wanna use like cross-site request forgery tokens for that? You don't wanna use headers because they're pretty simple to spoof. Um, you can set to strict origin when cross origin. That's not only a mouthful, I think it's about a terabyte to send over the wire. But it's still shorter than the content security policy. But this is a default setting today. So don't send it to a protocol that is less secure than the one you're currently on. So HTTPS down to HTTP. And finally, unsafe URL. So just like PHP, we gotta have a very unsafe dangerous option, LOL security. It's kind of like Oprah with headers. You get a header and you get a header and you know, it just hands it out to everybody. And permissions policy. So I just came across this site last night when I was bird watching. It's a bad joke. Um, <laughs> controls what features your site actually needs to use when you use it, right? This permissions policy that kind of site actually does a great job of building a permissions policy. So if your site doesn't need to access my camera, you can specify that inside of the headers. Then, when later somebody is attacking your site or doing something to your site to manipulate what it's requesting, the headers are already specified. They can't go and exceed it and look for GPS locations or cameras or whatever else your site may request. So this one will say, hey, accelerometer, autoplay and battery, autoplay for some content types. You are allowed to be used by the site. However, the camera is not allowed. Now, Facebook, Metaverse, Instagram, whatever they call it today, um, likes to access cameras regardless. I'm sure that they probably allow it in their permissions policy if they have one, but that's what that one's for. All right, so useful header attributes. So I talked primarily about just headers. Now, when you think in terms of cookies, there are three attributes inside there besides expires and value and key, right? First one is HTTP only. That one is a weird name point because you think like, who's going to use HTTP only cookies? That does allow HTTPS as well. I should be clear about that. What that doesn't allow you to do is document.cookie to go and pull a cookie out of a browser. So it enforces that it's only sent across HTTP protocol, not, a, not through JavaScript. That helps with cross-site cross scripting where people are trying to steal cookies. The next one is secure. That one is HTTPS only, which they don't call it that, they just call it secure because standards. So this one will only allow your cookie to be transmitted over HTTPS. So if, if some parts of your web application are HTTP, for example, if you have a good old mixed content where the site is secure but you have an image that isn't secure, traditionally that cookie would have been sent along with that. And for if anybody doesn't know what a cookie is or a session is, it's basically your driver's license from the interwebs. So I can send along so everybody can identify you as your current session or state within the application. So that's kind of a problem because if I could post an image to a site and pull your cookie, and your cookie is transmitted as part of that, I could potentially get into your account. And finally, the same site. This one's newer, it's not used as often. What that does is it controls how cookies are propagated between requests. So if I'm going from Bob's Bank to Bob's Bank, that cookie is going to persist when I land on that second page. If I'm going from Bob's Evil Bank to Bob's Bank, if I have same site set to strict, what will happen is it will actually remove those cookies, so it will be set to a not logged in page. 
Any questions on that so far? I'm getting towards the end, so you start thinking about questions, okay? Difficult ones too. So what's next? What am I going to what am I planning for the future of this? It has been stagnating for a little while now. Um, it has been safe for about two years, but I want to build in an API. It already has a fully functional API under the sheets. I just neglected to build Swaggerdot for it. Um, anybody who works with security orchestration or automates things, which is probably everybody who's a developer, probably some security folks, probably a lot of IT folks, you could send automatic requests and just pull this thing continuously or anytime you do deployment and go and check and see how are our headers. Did we forget something? Did we forget to turn off directory indexing like I did in mine? Uh, what else? So scanning beyond the bare host. What it is, if you post a request to this, it doesn't check the URL you give it. It goes to the base host request set and checks those headers. It was easier to basically contain, uh, contain the flow of where we were going. So if I wanted to see, okay, every time you make a request, your score gradually goes up, but you would be surprised at how often it actually happens. That people actually use this as a tool to fix things. Um, I can check that. If I'm getting a bunch of random URLs, you might be handling different parts or subdomains or scripts on your site differently, which would impact the results. Also, it doesn't support any sort of internal requests currently. I might make a Chrome extension, I might not, but right now if you have inter or company .local, I can't get to that because it's not facing the internet, unless you, like, I don't know, want me to come visit you on your VPN. You probably don't want that either. Um, I won't go much beyond the header inspection with it because there are DAS tools. My company, Rep7, I'm not spamming, but they, you know, they make a pretty good DAS tool themselves. So uh, you can always dig into that. And finally, better to find permissions policy. So I feel like we could probably do a lot more work with that already instead of just saying, you have it, it's great, and move on. But it falls into the same category as content security policy, where it's kind of hard to check what you're actually using within your web application if you don't specify it. Might be a little quick. Yeah, a little quick, but cool. Any questions? Any thoughts? Anybody want to make fun of PHP with me? I love it, by the way. <coughs> not, not even one. It's because it's lunch. It's noon. You guys showed up to my talk. Well, I appreciate that. Um, if there's no extra questions or anything else, that's pretty much all I have on headers for today. Thank you.